Hey everybody, Nick Espinosa, your chief security fanatic here, and it is Sunday, so we are doing breaches of the week, as always, or at least we try to do it always. And before I begin, as always, I'd like to thank the following people that sent me a ton of this information because it always helps me out. And that would be Jason Dance, Chris Fallon, Barrett Peterson, and Richard Roudzi. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you so very much. And if you have a tip for me, please feel free to send it my way and I'll give you a shout out here and also on my nationally syndicated radio show as well. Now with that, let's get going because we have an absolute ton of data breaches to cover this week. And the first one is Illuminate Education. This is education software. They had a data breach and student data, including full names, birth dates, student IDs, state IDs, grades, transcripts, and demographic information were accessed, but not social security or financial information. And so if your school district uses Illuminate Education, heads up to you. The first uh, school district to declare a breach is school district 50, uh, school district 51 one in Grand Junction, Colorado. I expect there to be more. You know I'll keep you up to date. Moving on, let's talk about GitHub. Yes, the repository used by developers around the world. They have revealed details of a security breach that allowed an unknown attacker to download data from dozens of private code repositories. Now, the attacker apparently authenticated to GitHub's API using stolen OAuth user tokens that were issued to two third-party OAuth integrators. Those would be Heroku and Travis. Travis CI. Now, the attacker basically listed the private uh, repositories uh, and then basically uh, proceeded to clone them and, and uh, basically walked away with them. And we are looking at, quote unquote, dozens of victim organizations. So if you use GitHub, the developers out there, and you're using Heroku or Travis CI, you definitely want to make sure you're changing those tokens up. I'm sure they're doing that for you already. <laughs> Moving on. We have to talk about T-Mobile again, because last week I talked about T-Mobile and just going through the prolific amount of data breaches. And I'm going to be talking extensively about T-Mobile uh, in my radio show this week, but they are in the news in this last week. And this is absolutely nuts because as I said, last week I ended my, my, uh, my uh, breaches of the week with them and they're back here. So here's what's going on. In a post from Friday, security site Krebs on Security run by Brian Krebs revealed leaked chat messages between members of the Lapsus ransomware gang in which they discussed targeting T-Mobile employees with social engineering attacks designed to give them access to a victim's mobile phone number. Now, this is known as SIM swapping, and this tactic reassigns a phone number to a device owned by the attacker, therefore allowing them to intercept text messages and phone calls for password resets or multi-factor authentication codes. This is why we never recommend using text messages as your second factor of authentication. Go get yourself a good authenticator app. Now, using uh, T-Mobile's VPN credentials purchased on the dark web, Lapsus members were able to gain access to Atlas, which is a T-Mobile tool for managing customers' accounts. Again, according to Krebs on security. As some of the gang members argued over whether to focus on the SIM swapping tactics, one person used the access to run an automated script that downloaded more than 30,000 source code repositories from T-Mobile and their own development stack. So obviously T-Mobile is just rife with vulnerability. And uh, as I detailed, uh, you know, as I was uh, basically recording that segment for my radio show ahead of time, because, you know, I travel and it's just easier sometimes to record my show as opposed to do it live. Uh, this is what I was talking about is that they are just they've had something like seven breaches since 2018. It is absolutely nuts. Moving on though, because we've got a lot of fish to fry this week, we're going to be talking about the United Kingdom's army. That's right, the UK army. So here's what's going on. <clears throat> the army's online recruitment portal has been offline for more than a month following a data breach. Now, officials shut down the computerized enrollment system in the middle of March as a precaution after the personal data of more than 100 UK army recruits was found being offered for sale on the dark web. An investigation was launched to determine whether the cyber criminals had hacked into the internal uh, defense recruitment system and exfiltrated recruits' personal data. Data reportedly exposed in this incident includes full names of um, full names, dates of birth, addresses, qualifications. I assume to join the army and previous employment details as well. So heads up if you are attempting to join the army in the UK, make sure your data is safe. Moving on. Speaking of defense, let's talk about Blue Force Inc. According to their website and I quote, Blue Force operates a unique nexus between the Department of Defense and the Department of State. We currently maintain a balanced portfolio of missions in each department. Blue Force has operated in over 40 countries to date. And on April 10th, or excuse me, April 20th of this year, Blue Force unfortunately had to send out data breach letters to all parties who ins information was leaked as a result of a data breach. Now, based on that letter, on May 4th of 2021, last year, almost 
to the day, Blue Force uh, basically experienced a disruption in some of its computer systems. Now, in response, the company enlisted the assistance of an outside, outside third-party cybersecurity uh, consultant, and they began looking into this. The Basically, the investigation confirmed that unauthorized parties who orchestrated this attack had access to certain files basically in the Blue Force network on May 4th of 2021. So here we are. They sent a letter out to everybody. Now, while Blue Force's letter does not disclose any additional details about the breach, some news outlets report that the Conti ransomware gang is claiming responsibility for this attack. And here we are. So there you go. If you have anything to do with Blue Force, hopefully they've let you know. Moving on. Let's talk about MailChimp, and this is all according to a class action suit, so understand that this is one side of the story and not MailChimp's, but I think it's important to report as well. Here's what's going on, and I quote, Intuit and its subsidiary MailChimp failed to prevent a data breach earlier this month that resulted in millions of dollars of stolen cryptocurrency, and that is according to a new class action. Now, the plaintiff, Alan Levinson, claims Intuit and MailChimp failed to ensure its data systems were protected, prevent the breach from happening, or just disclose it in a timely manner. Mr. Levinson also claims that unknown attackers were able to obtain the customer list for users of Trezor, which sells offline hardware cryptocurrency wallets due to basically information being negligently stored, quote unquote, by MailChimp. Now, the attackers use that information to send out phishing emails purported to be from Trezor that stated, quote, data has been compromised and that their cryptocurrency was, quote, at risk of being stolen. And that's, again, according to the class action. I remember reporting on that. That when that happened, obviously that was a huge thing. A lot of people fell for that scam. Now, Mr. Levinson also claims that users were uh, directed to a fake Trezor website where they were, quote, prompted to download a new version of the Trezor Suite desktop application, which gave the attackers access to the account information. I remember reporting on that as well. And Mr. Levinson also says that approximately $82,000 worth of cryptocurrency was stolen from his account by these unknown attackers, and he blames MailChimp and Intuit for allowing this data breach to occur. Basically, MailChimp got hit. Uh, they were sending out phishing emails uh, that basically looked like legitimate customers of MailChimp. <clears throat> and they were targeting cryptocurrency. And here we are. So obviously, MailChimp and Intuit, I guess the parent company, I had no idea Intuit owned MailChimp, uh, has things to say about that. But that is from the class action lawsuit. So understand that is one side of the coin. I'm sure MailChimp and Intuit have a lot to say. Moving on, <clears throat> let's talk about Adaptive Health Integrations of Williston, North Dakota. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services said that Adaptive Health was the target of a hacking slash IT incident, and this data breach was reported to the government earlier this month. Now, this happened on or about October 17 of last year. <clears throat> Quote, an unauthorized individual may have accessed a limited amount of data stored on our systems. And so here you are. They disabled their network to fix it, et cetera, et cetera. HHS is saying the security breach affected 510,570 four people. Obviously, that's a lot. So if you have anything to do with adaptive health integrations of Williston, North Dakota, heads up. Moving on, let's talk about Sterley Valling Systems. They are also known as or do business as Intopia. Now, they announced a large data breach after an unauthorized party was app, uh, able to gain access to their network. And as a result, credit card numbers and debit card numbers of 17,952 people were compromised. On April 21st of 2022, uh, Intopia sent out basically uh, letters to notify those people. So I don't have much more than that, but heads up to do. If you work with Sterling uh, Valley Systems, a.k.a. Intopia, you may have an issue. Moving on, let's talk about Liberty Partners Financial Services. They announced an unauthorized party gain access to an employee's account, basically compromising systems. Now, according to them, what we are talking about here is names as well as dates of birth, social security, driver's license, state IDs, passport numbers, bank account, credit or debit card numbers, biometric data, medical information, and health insurance information. On April 22nd of this year, they issued data breach letters to basically everybody. So heads up to you if you use Liberty Partner Financial Services. Moving on, let's talk about Smile Brands. They got hit with a ransomware attack, and subsequent data theft impacted approximately 2.6 million of their patients. Now, Smile Brands is a dental support services vendor, and Smile Brands reported the incident to the Department of HHS on June, uh, basically on June 24th, 2021. Or rather, the incident happened on June 24, 2021, and impacted 199,683 uh, individuals. However, the latest filing with the Maine Attorney General's office shows that update has that update tally has been increased to 2,592,494 individuals, including employees of Smile Brand. So, heads up to you for 
Smile Brands for all your dental whatever. Now, moving on, let's talk about Batele for Kids. This is a company that houses students' state testing information. They got hit with a ransomware attack. I don't know much more than that, but the first school to declare that Batele for Kids got them hit was the Lakota Local Schools in Cincinnati, Ohio. So heads up to you, Lakota Local Schools. Your students are affected. Moving on, let's talk about Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority. An unauthorized person had access to its computer networks between January 23rd and March 16th of this year, and obviously got a hold of a whole bunch of stuff. Now, according to the letters sent to people affected, the files that they took contained information like names, addresses, dates of birth, and social security numbers. I don't have more at this time. <clears throat> Heads up, Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority in Ohio. Moving on, let's talk about Mint Mobile. This is the smaller cellular carrier best known for being owned by famous actor Ryan Reynolds. Mint Mobile basically is facing several claims brought by a customer who says that Mint, basically Mint, uh, a Mint data breach, I should say, exposed his personal information and caused him to have $466,000 with with, uh, worth of cryptocurrency stolen. And that's according to a California federal judge who basically adjusted these claims and all that kind of stuff. It just says who trimmed the claims uh, from the article that I'm quoting here. Now, Daniel Fraser sued Mint, alleging that it failed to secure the personal identifiable information of its cell phone customers, allowing attackers to access their names, addresses, email addresses, phone numbers, account numbers, and passwords. Because his information was uh, exposed, Mr. Fraser says the attackers were able to hijack his SIM, open up account with a different cell carrier in his name, and then obviously go to work stealing his information and his money. So we'll see where this goes. Obviously, it's a huge problem. It's a big black eye for Mint Mobile, who has pretty catchy commercials. <laughs> Moving on, I want to give you an update on Wawa. You might remember they had a massive data breach. Um, basically, Wawa has turned around and sued MasterCard International for at least $10.7 million for basically what Wawa claims were unjust penalties assessed for their 2019 data breach. Now, Wawa accused a uh, purchase-based MasterCard of violating data security protocols in a lawsuit filed on April 18th in U.S. District Court, White Plains. Now, the credit card company unjustly enriched itself, the complaint states, quote, through fraud, duress, and taking of undue advantage by leveraging its position to unilaterally withhold funds that it knew or should have known it had no right to withhold. Looks like Wawa is trying to recoup some of their monetary losses to their data breach. If you recall, they got a class action and everybody that shopped at Wawa got, I believe it was like $500 uh, like debit cards from, from Wawa. So we'll see what happens there. But heads up to you, uh, Wawa, if, they, if it goes deep enough with MasterCard, they may have to stop taking MasterCard because MasterCard may pull out. Moving on, let's talk about the Tacoma, Washington-based dental supply company, Burkhart Dental Supply. They announced that they had a security incident, and as a result, certain customers' names, social security numbers, dates of birth, and driver's license numbers or state ID numbers were compromised. On April 20th of this year, Burkhart basically sent out Reach letters to all affected parties, so heads up to you, Tacoma, Washington. Moving on. Let's talk about the Illinois Gastroenterology Group. They got hit with a breach in October, according to a disclosure on April 22nd. It kind of took you a while, guys. Now, they discovered this unusual activity, as I said, on October 22nd 22nd of last year, and they launched an investigation with a third-party group on November 18th. They found that an unauthorized party had gained access uh, into their systems, and the affected patients may have had their information compromised, including names, social security numbers, address, dates of birth, driver's license, or state ID and financial account information. So if you are a patient of Illinois Gastroenterology Group, heads up to you, you may eventually be entitled for compensation. (laughs) Moving on, let's talk about Wyandotte County in Kansas. And I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly because as of April 27th, basically a mid-April attack, um, basically this was reported on April 27th, a mid-April attack on the county's computer systems continues to cripple basically services in the county, including the court system, meaning they've shut everything down. Local reports believe it's ransomware, but the county has not confirmed yet. And so if you live in Wyandotte, Wyandotte County in Kansas, uh, right now your local government may have a hard time servicing you heads up there. Moving on, let's talk about the Chicago-based South Shore Hospital. This is actually an update from a December uh, cyber attack that left 115,617 patients, 70 patients, protected, uh, basically uh, vulnerable. They're protected information or protected health information. I cannot speak today for the record, but we're going to get through this. 
They are now, South Shore Hospital in Chicago is now facing three different lawsuits. Now, these lawsuits were all filed by former South Shore patients, which were filed on April 5th, April 7th, and April 18th. The plaintiffs allege the hospital failed to adequately protect patient data, and here we are. So there you go. If you have anything to do with South Shore Hospital or were caught up in that data breach, you might be able to file a lawsuit along with the other three. Moving on, let's talk about the Portland-based Organ Anesthesiology Group, they are being sued by a Portland patient over a breach of health and personal data last year that may have involved the information of hundreds of thousands of their patients. Now, this patient is seeking class action status for the lawsuit and wants, among other things, for the court to order the anesthesiology practice to upgrade its data protection and pay for identity theft and credit monitoring for patients for at least three years. I'm always for credit monitoring and identity management uh, and identity monitoring as well. I'm also all for upgrading security systems, hopefully it shouldn't have to take a class action to court order to get companies to do it. So heads up, if you uh, use Oregon Anesthesiology Group, you may be able to join a class action lawsuit if it gets off the ground. Moving on, let's talk about Arkansas medical provider AR Care or R Care, which is what I'm calling them. They had a quote unquote malware infection don't know much more about that, but personal information that could have been hit was name, social security, driver's license, or state ID, dates of birth, financial accounts, medical treatment, prescriptions, medical diagnosis or condition, and health insurance, and 345,000 individuals may have been affected. So if you use our care, the Arkansas medical provider heads up to you. Moving on, let's talk about, and I'm totally going to butcher this, I do not speak French, the GHT Coer Grand Est Hospitals and Healthcare Group in North East France. We're just going to call them GHT. Now, the cyber attack occurred on April 19 and caused GHT to disconnect the internet from their hospitals to prevent the attack from spreading and uh, basically to thwart further data theft. Now, the hospital network says the attackers also managed to copy out administrative computer data stored on their systems and warn that the threat actors may publish or use this data, but patient care continues as usual while the software used in the hospital was not impacted by the incident. So even though their internet is cut off, their internal IT systems remain on Online and they are able to service patients, just not get out to the internet. Moving on, let's talk about Coca-Cola. Yes, the Coca-Cola, one of the largest corporations in the world. They're investigating claims of a large-scale data breach by Russian-linked cyber uh, cybercrime gang known as Stormus or Stormus. Now, the ransomware group posted on its website this week that it successfully hacked the servers of Coca-Cola and stolen 161 gigabytes of data. It also offered that data for sale for about $64,000. Uh, US. Obviously, it's about 1.6, 1.7 Bitcoin. Um, Stormus did not specify the type of data it stole, but Coca-Cola says they are investigating and will figure this out. Obviously, that's a pretty low number for Coca-Cola, which leads me to believe Stormus didn't get anything of interest uh, that could, let's say, help them run identity theft scams or make them money. And so here we are. They didn't get the secret formula to Coca-Cola. Now, moving on. Let's talk about St. Mary's and Good Samaritan Hospitals. This is they're owned by a company called Tenant in Florida. Now, the company said they had a cybersecurity incident that is still under investigation. They said their acute care operations were temporarily disrupted. There are still some systems that aren't working properly, but the company says progress is being made to get full functionality to those hospitals back. And so if you use or are a patient of St. Mary's and Good Samaritan Hospitals in Florida, heads up to you, uh, you may see a disruption in service. Moving on, let's talk about the online library app only he, I'm assuming that's not English, according to the announcement, there was a system failure last week deleting files that were encrypted with copyright protections. Those files have to now be re-encrypted and uploaded into the library to be made available to its patrons, which is currently ongoing. Now, what happened here apparently was a service provider for Only He, known as e, uh, EKZ, suffered a cyber attack on April 18th of this year, which basically rendered some of their specific systems that this online library was using and Lockbit Ransomware Gang is claiming responsibility. So there you go. If you use the Only He, Only He uh, online library app, heads up, it is down. Thank you very much, Lockbit. <laughs> Moving on, let's talk about the government of Costa Rica. Yes, the entire government. Um, apparently, they had basically um, a disruption due to a ransomware attack, which was claimed by the Conti Ransomware Gang, according to the Associated Press. Now, issues related to the attack were first reported by the country's finance minister Minister this past Monday, which noted that the intrusion has compromised tax collection, importation, and exportation systems, prompting shutdowns as well as granting of tax payment extensions. Because uh, obviously,
obviously, if they can't collect the money and you still owe taxes, they're going to want it eventually. Now, Conti has already leaked 50% of the data that is stolen, including over 850 gigabytes from the finance ministry, the Social Security Agency, uh, the, yeah, the Social Security Agency's Human Resources System, and the Labor Ministry, as well as other agencies, are also reporting a tax afterwards. Now, despite the challenges in trying to implement a whole bunch of workarounds to keep fun government functioning, the Costa Rican government insisted that it will not actually pay the ransomware demand, which was said to be $10 million, and that was essentially the number that has been circulated everywhere. And so we'll see. The government of Costa Rica basically gets knocked out, not going to pay. They're standing on their own two feet. We'll see what happens. But heads up, Costa Ricans, your government's got some issues right now. Moving on. Let's talk about Westchester County Library in the state of New York. They basically confirmed that they were target of a ransomware attack, but said they don't believe that per, uh, patrons' personal information was ever at risk. That's all the information I have right now. So heads up, Westchester County Library patrons in New York State. Moving on, let's talk about the Austin Pay University, Austin Pay State University. Excuse me. This is a recent one. They just had an attack on April 27th, and they essentially issued a campus-wide alert notifying everybody to disconnect from the network at approximately 2.26 uh, p.m. on April 27th, and the message that followed a few minutes later was basically a clarification to shut down all computers. <clears throat> so here we go. They're in the process of remediating that. I do not have any much more information. Good luck, Austin Pay State University. And finally, and we have two finalies for you here, and I wish I didn't have to bring you this, but quite frankly, I've got to. Transparency is a thing. We have to talk about Smartmatic. This is the voting company that had been, was one of the focal points of the stolen election claims of 2020. If you recall the whole release the Kraken thing about all the evidence of Smartmatic being part of a Venezuelan plot to overturn the election or whatever it is, that's the Smartmatic we are talking about. And we are actually heading to Manila, Philippines for this one because here's what's going on. Authorities in the Philippines announced on Tuesday, April 26th, that it arrested three members of a hackers group allegedly behind the supposed data breach involving Smartmatic. Obviously, they do software for, for voting machines, that kind of stuff. Now, in a press breach, uh, briefing, the Philippine National Police and the Cybercrime Investigation and Coordination Center said the attackers tried to XSOX were captured, meaning this is the group that they were with, XSOX, not tried, tied to. Excuse me. They were captured following an entrapment operation in Imus City, uh, basically, um, as well as Santa Saint Rosa City as well in Laguna on Saturday, April 23rd. So they hit two cities, arrested three individuals. Now, the CICC chief said that his agency's operatives met this group three times prior to Saturday's operation, pretending that they were interested in the group's plans to manipulate election results. These men were allegedly seeking to scam interested politicians. Now, XSOX... Um, supposedly asked the CICC agents for a P60 uh, million payment, meaning, I guess, 60 million of Philippines currency for their services and a $10 million uh, Philippine, Philippine currency down payment. Qu quote, the threats to rig the electoral process, especially on hacking, is substantially diminished as these are the only remaining known hackers who are persistently visible on the dark web claiming that they could manipulate the elections. Again, this is the elections in the Philippines. Now, based on the results, Result of the National Bureau of Investigation out of the Philippines probe, which was prevent, uh, presented to their Senate, uh, Senate Electoral Reforms Panel on April 19th, XSOS first contacted Smartmatic through an email on January claiming that it had infiltrated the company's network. In the days that followed, XSOS also posted on Facebook photos of files it had allegedly stolen from Smartmatic. Now, the files they got were from a rogue employee who, according to investigators, and I quote, shared his credentials to an unknown third party whom he met through Facebook Messenger, allegedly in an exchange of free lectures. <laughs> Smartmatic said the employee was fired in January and that more stringent measures have been enforced since then. Despite the controversy, no data in relation to the 2022 polls have been acquired by XSOS, meaning it is secured. Nothing was stolen um, or altered uh, in the Smartmatic uh, ecosystem, if you will. Now, the NBI also 
disputed um, the attackers' claims that they were able to download 60 gigabytes worth of election-related data. That was in reference to the Manila Bulletin report in January, which first reported about the supposed data breach, although the COMELEC, which I believe is the election committee uh, in Philippine, later pointed out several loopholes in that story. I'm obviously reading from a Philippine publication here on this, um, you know, so so I'm trying to keep up with their terminology for their government because they don't know it that well, so there you go. And to quote, once again, when you compare it to the logs provided by Smartmatic, the former employee was only able to download four gigabytes of information. This is why even if XSOS is threatening Smartmatic and the public that they are going to expose sensitive information until now, they have failed to fulfill their threat. Now, the three men arrested will face charges for violation of the Cybercrime Prevention Act of 2012, according to Philippine government officials. <laughs> Smartmatic basically has uh, bagged a total of uh, three point one nine three point one one nine billion dollars uh philippine currency in deals for the 2022 polls including a 402 million dollar again philippine currency contract for the comelex procurement of automated uh, election system software for may 9 meaning smartmatic is going to be very heavily used uh in the may 9th election in the philippines now the poll body withheld part of that payment to smartmatic until they cleared up this breach mess and here we are and so there you go uh somebody claims to have gotten into smartmatic apparently they didn't uh, they did not hack in to Smartmatic. They essentially were able to social engineer somebody to give them a password. I don't know if that person was colluding with them or just gave it to them unknowingly that he was doing that. But here we are, obviously Smartmatic on the hook for that. And there's a lot of focus on Smartmatic because of the 2020 election. And I will re reiterate again that, that multiple cybersecurity agencies, both U.S. government agencies as well as independents, <laughs> have looked at the 2020 election continuously and said that there was nothing like this that that happened. I personally watched Mike Lindell's cyber symposium where he was going to have the evidence. I wrote a complete article on that. Nothing has materialized to date. So heads up to you. I'm sure this will be used as fodder for the release the Kraken folks, but so far we have not seen anything malfeasance wise come up or any evidence of that here in the United States. And I hope the Philippines election is very secure on May 9th. And finally, finally, I want to talk about a startling new report from the research team known as Group IB because they carried out a deep dive into exposed digital assets discovered in 2021 and it's kind of shocking. Now, during this research, they analyze instances of hosting internet-facing databases, meaning you've got that database in Amazon or Microsoft or IBM or Google or wherever you're putting it, and it is exposed to the public right for attack or theft. Now, the findings show that in the second half of 2021, the number of public-facing databases increased by 16% to 165,600, with most of them being stored on servers in the United States. The number of databases exposed to the open web has been growing every quarter to reach its peak of 91,200 in the first quarter of 2022. Now, corporate digital assets that are not properly managed undermine security investment and increase the attack surface of corporations and organizations. The consequences Consequences of an exposed database range from a data breach, uh, follow-up attacks on employees or customers because their information has been stolen, all those kinds of things. Having open databases is a terrifying thing. Now, as the pandemic progressed with more people having to work from home, oftentimes in emergency situations, if you all remember, we all got kicked out of the office to come home, corporate networks keep getting more complex and also more extended. This inevitably led to the increase in the number of public-facing assets that were not inventoried properly. Asset management is an incredibly important thing. Now, in 2021, nearly $1.2 billion worth of penalties have been issued against companies for violating uh, things like the GDPR. And specifically, uh, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. These exposures basically violate GDPR compliance. Now, according to IBM, the average cost of a data breach uh, basically rose from 3.8 million, 3.86 million US to 4.24 million last year. And in many cases, a data breach starts with a preventable security risk, such as a database that's open that could have been secured. Now, as such, in 2021 alone, Group IB identified 308,000 
inst uh, incidence of databases exposed to the open web. The number of public facing databases keeps growing almost every quarter since the beginning of 2021 to peak in uh, first quarter of 2022. Most of those exposed databases were discovered between the first quarter of 2021 and the first quarter of 2022. And they were using what is known as the Redis database management system, meaning the majority of those exposed databases were using Redis. Now, when it comes to management of high risk digital assets, timely discoveries obviously play a key role as attackers are quick in spotting a chance to basically get in and steal sensitive information or to get further into the infrastructure of the organization. And according to these findings, in the first quarter of 2021, it took an average of 170.2 days for an exposed database owner to actually fix the issue. Meaning you have over just over 170 days of an exposed database at least at least out there. The average time was decreasing gradually over 2021, but it climbed back up uh, basically to the value of 170 in the first quarter of 2022. Now, country-wise, last year, most of the databases exposed to the open web were discovered on servers located in the United States, which means the United States continues to be the number one target for attacks in the world, uh, specifically cyber attacks. And we all know we're gearing up for Russian cyber attacks and all that kind of stuff. So this was a crazy long breaches of the week. Obviously, there's a ton there. Uh, we're going to say everybody was affected. Let's just go with that this week. And there you go. I'll see you next time. And please like, share, follow me here on Facebook and Twitter at Nick AESP. And please feel free to subscribe to me at YouTube as well. And as always, stay safe, stay online, and please stay private. Thanks, everyone.